there are two worlds, one on the surface and another in the shadows, on the margins of our society where opportunity meets disadvantage. This is the underworld economy. But how does this economy function? What is the role of opportunity and disadvantage and how do they shape crime? I'll try to shed some light on these obscure aspects of our society through my personal story and I'm going to use economics as a vehicle, as a language to analyze society, but also as a means to try to make it better. My mother used to talk to me about disadvantage and opportunity, giving me simple examples from our own neighborhood. So when I first heard about Karl Marx, I started developing an interest in studying economics. Then when I found about Adam Smith, uh, the founder of economics, who developed the subject here at the University of Glasgow, and then the great economist, John Maynard Keynes, I was certain that I wanted to be an economist. As you said, my friends felt that economics is something boring. However, I was, I was relieved when I realized that I could study almost anything using economics, from crime to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So there are papers in economics which analyze how sex workers price discriminate and they charge more the customers they like less. There are studies which find that drug gangs have sophisticated hierarchical organization structures which are very similar to those of multinational corporations. And in the music industry, rights holders in several occasions lobby just to extend the term of copyright and keep on receiving benefits from the same old songs by the Beatles or by Jimi Hendrix. Actually, I've just realized that it is kind of redundant having three pictures for sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Just Jimi Hendrix encapsulates all of them quite nicely. <laughs> so I could just keep that one. Um, so you can examine all these things, but what was the main concept that all the great economists focused on? The key and the most interesting problem is what promotes economic progress and social prosperity. So surprisingly, we rely heavily on just one number per capita GDP. This is very, uh, a very good index. However, by itself, it cannot give you uh, the whole picture. Consider that the 10 richest people on Earth just double their income. Per capita GDP would also increase, while the vast majority of people on Earth will not become better off. So it is not only how income is generated and how it grows, but how it is distributed across people that matters. So the allocation of resources is also key. However, some people cannot access these resources legally. So they might have to approach opportunity and access resources illegally. And this is how crime enters the core of economics. So I'll try to use economics in order to give a simple answer to this basic behavioral question of whether to commit a crime or not, which somehow translates to the pure Shakespearean question to be or not to be, because if you cannot access resources legally, the only way to survive might be through crime. So we'll see if economics can tell us something about it. The first to examine this was Gary Becker from the Chicago School. Back then in the 60s, when he developed his theory of crime and punishment, he didn't have the data, but he had sharp economic intuition and he could encapsulate interesting aspects of our behavior in just simple uh, relationships. So this is the key behavioral relation according to the Beckerian logic, which suggests that individuals weigh the illegal gains, the net illegal gains, and if they are larger than the legal gains on the margin and holding other things constant, they will decide to commit more crime. So let's take each of these elements uh, one by one. If the success probability times the illegal gains minus the probability of being caught times the punishment, which is the net <laughs> illegal gains, 
if this is larger than the gains that you get from staying within the law, people will do more crime. When legal gains, as they are measured by employment, earnings, or minimum wages, so when legal gains increase, you would expect crime to decline. When sanctions and punishments increase, you would expect crime to de decrease, in theory. When the probability of being caught increases, again, you would expect crime to decline. Importantly, when the direct illegal gains that criminals can take by stealing increase, you should expect to see more crime. These are some very nice theoretical concepts, and this simple equation is full of intuition. One additional, for instance, intuition is that when the probability of being caught is very low, then an increase in the punishment might keep the product of the two similar, and this can balance our behavior. So there are such simple uh, lessons. However, theories, there, there might be one fact that many different theories can attempt to explain. We have to go into the data and see if these things hold in reality. And this is how the Glasgow School appears in the picture. Adam Smith developed several uh, interesting concepts. From He focused on sympathy in his theory of moral sentiments, and then he moved on to self-interest in the wealth of nations. And he also developed a very key concept for our society, the division of labor. However, it was not enough for him to explain this in a theory. He went to a pin factory and he measured if dividing labor is indeed more efficient. Similarly, Lord Kelvin once said that if you can measure what you're talking about, then you know something about it. If you cannot, then you are far from doing science. So let's see if this logic from the Glasgow School has something to tell us when we bring data into the basic theory of crime. Several economists adopted this approach, and now that we have the data, it is a good time to test these predictions. So in terms of legal gains, an increase in unemployment should actually increase crime. Let's see what the data suggests. Here you can see in the horizontal axis, we have unemployment rate, and when this increases, you also have some increase in the vertical axis where you have crime. So there seems to be some correlation between the two of them. There are several different studies which adopt different methodologies, and all of them find small or larger gains uh, from legal gains and the connection between legal gains and crime. Moving on, to this uh, controversial debate about the severity of sanctions and even capital punishments, it would be interesting to see if the data suggests that this can work. So I'll use just one example from the literature. There are lots of papers in here. So if individuals respond to the severity of punishments just before and just after the age of 18, punishments increase by more than 200%. So if they respond, criminal behavior should change just before and just after the age of 18. Okay, this is a very basic logic. You should fight a discontinuity just before and just after 18. Indeed, punishments, as you can see, increase sharply just after the age of 18. But what happens to legal gains? The gains from crime, as they are measured in property crime and violent crime, do not seem to change. They don't change just before and just after. So this is telling us that punishment by itself is not enough to reduce and deter crime. Of course, there are other studies which find uh, the opposite and so on, but it seems that there is not as clear as the case with legal gains. Moving on, we have the probability of being caught. An increase in the probability of being caught should reduce crime. There is a nice study here that two similar um, crime scenes have a different response station. The police response station is far away from that one, but it's much closer for this one. So would this deter crime? And they actually, people uh, approximate the speed of response to the distance from the crime scene. 
and they find that there is indeed a strong effect of clearing the crime and uh, there is a link between the probability of being caught and crime. The most interesting, in, in my opinion, aspect relates to the direct gains from crime, illegal gains, or what we call returns from crime. With my two amazing co-authors, Mirko Draka and Stephen Machin, we developed this framework to see if criminals respond and steal the products that yield a higher return. We collected the data of all the products that people steal from mobile phones and DVD players, everything, laptops. And we have the count of each of these for every month for 11 years. We got this data from the New Scotland Yard, the London Metropolitan Police. So we connect the quantity, the stolen quantity of each of these products with the price of this product at this given month. So we have 132 months that we match the quantity of products and the price of them. And just an illustrative example here, you can see that for audio, radio, hi-fi and CD players, there is a decrease in prices and there is also a decrease in crime. Similarly, for watches, there is an increase in price and an increase in crime. So this somehow contrasts that there is a link between prices and stolen quantities. We follow two approaches. One covers the vast majority of property stolen, and uh, this is displayed actually here, just as correlation. And it shows that changes in prices are positively correlated with changes in crime. So this, the structure of our data and the richness of our data, allow us to control for time effects and time invariant product specific characteristics. The fact that, for instance, a fridge is much heavier than a mobile phone. So this might be associated with different differences in the difficulty of stealing it. Okay, so we can control of this and we leave a clean effect of prices to the stolen quantity. And it seems to be a strong and positive. And actually the response of criminals is quite fast. The second approach that we follow is that we focus on a particular group of products which has increased sharply in terms of crime. And this is metal crimes. As you can see, all metals, all crime decreases, but metal crime seems to increase sharply. Mainly, this reflects, we feel that this reflects changes in commodity prices for these particular goods because, for instance, China grows and they want to build more, they want to use more aluminum and copper and so on. Is this important? It seems that it is the scale of metal crime is huge. Only in one year in the UK, it costs approximately 770 million pounds, only metal cable theft. In terms of passenger minutes, it costs approximately 240,000 passenger minutes. So whenever there is a delay in your train, a metal thief is stealing copper from the rail lines. So this is interesting. <laughs> Selected headlines from 2012 suggest that metal theft cost 10 million to the Church of England. And uh, in the Czech Republic, some thieves have stolen a 10 ton bridge. <laughs> While they also steal cages at the animal hospital. Okay, so the scale of metal theft is, is huge. Let's see what is the link between prices of these commodities and the stolen quantity. Here we have all metals, and you can see that there is a link between changes in prices and changes in stolen quantity. But also we have copper, and in copper in particular, the link is so close. Apart from trying to find correlations only, we establish a causal link. The way to do this is the following. We observe the direct benefit to the criminals, which is the scrap metal price. So they steal copper, they sell it to the scrap dealer, and this is the scrap metal price that they get. And we instrument this to exogenous shocks in the global commodity prices, which are arguably exogenous to metal theft in London. So this is our method to identify the link from the cause to effect. So what is the main message of, of our approach? Our approach suggests that one of the most important aspects which relates to the returns from crime is understudied in the existing literature. 
And this is surprising, but it is somehow justified because we didn't have the data in the past. What is the message of the entire analysis from these and previous studies? Individuals seem to be in search of opportunity. If they can find and access resources and opportunity legally, they might do so. If they cannot, crime might be the only way for them to do it. And there are lessons of this approach for different uh, disciplines, for different social problems apart from crime. Actually, when it comes to economic and uh, social policy, we have to be really cautious because if, for instance, we decrease punishments, this might have detrimental effects for the society as a whole. So we have to approach policy with incertitude. And I cannot find of a better way than relying on both key theoretical concepts, but also in testing theoretical predictions using data and good research methods, and then updating our results with better data and better methods. So this is one big message of this. But the key take away from my talk, I think, is the following. From drug dealers in Glasgow to metal thieves in London and from entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley to bankers in the Wall Street, they all seem to obey some basic laws of human behavior. They all obey some fundamental economic forces which determine both how the economy on the surface functions, but also the underworld economy, which remains an underexplored and a challenging aspect of our world. Thank you.